Hello, friends. Welcome back to the Holistic Nutritionist podcast. My name is Natalie Douglas and I am your host, but I'm not alone today. I'm joined by the incredibly intelligent and lovely Dawn Witten. So before we jump into my conversation with Dawn, I wanted to give you a bit of a background on her. She is, gosh, it's hard to actually fit all the things she's done into one short bio. So I am going to summarize a little bit, but I'll pop all the information to learn more about her and her background in the show notes. So Dawn is a naturopath and international board certified lactation consultant. She's passionate about protecting and nurturing the microbiome of the next generation and has a broad base of clinical experience with a focus on women's health through pregnancy and beyond and infant and toddler health. She has been in clinical practice for 17 years. Dawn has a particular passion for improving practitioner knowledge in the area of lactation, maternal and infant health, and she regularly presents at both national and international conferences and online online events. Many of these online lectures can be accessed from probiotic-advisor.teachable.com, but I will pop that information in the show notes for you. And Dawn also regularly publishes papers in um, the peer-reviewed literature and has contributed to clinical textbooks. And she also coordinates two units within the evidence-based complementary medicine program in the College of Health and Medicine at the University of Tasmania. She also coordinates her clinic's internship program and regularly mentors in her areas of expertise. She is part of the Probiotic Advisor team, which is an online platform providing evidence-based information about probiotics and microbiome-related topics. Dawn has three daughters spanning seven years to 26 years who continue to contribute to her learning. She practices at Gould's Natural Medicine in Hobart, Tasmania, a 130-year-old apothecary, which each has an associated clinic and herb farm. So very exciting. Maybe just for us nerds out there, but that's okay. So in today's episode, Dawn and I discuss so many amazing, amazing things when it comes to introducing solid foods, including, you know, the what, the when, the how. We talk about allergies, breastfeeding, baby led weaning, common digestive issues when first reintroduced, when first introducing foods, I should say. And also I get Dawn to do a bit of myth busting because I love a good myth, myth busting session with experts. I think that it's really interesting uh, what comes up frequently. So, without further ado, let's jump into today's chat. Dawn, hello. Welcome to the Holistic Nutritionist podcast. It is so lovely to have you with me today and I'm really excited actually to jump in and ask you all of these questions because it isn't something that we've actually spoken about in detail um, before on the podcast and I wouldn't say that it's my number one area of expertise so it's always lovely to have someone on who is very much an expert in this area. Oh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, <laughs> You're it's great welcome. to collaborate. Yeah, it so is, isn't it? So before we jump into the topic of today's conversation, I really love to ask, especially my practitioner friends, what's inspiring you or exciting you right now in the world of natural medicine? Sure. Two things come to mind. Um, first of all, I guess, you know, We are, you know, it's been a dark time, hasn't it, going through this pandemic for everyone. And what, I mean, I also just, you know, disclaim that I'm, I feel that I've been fairly sheltered in all of that, you know, being on an island off the bottom of Australia. But still, I think there's been this amazing kind of capacity to go towards more simple naturopathic principles which I find kind of heartening you know at this time Mm. when there's that we've perhaps there's yeah there just seems to be a little bit of movement towards drawing on some more of that grassroots um, natural medicine practice 
Oh, yeah, I guess it's, it's kind of hopeful and just lovely to see that resilience within natural medicine, how it can be a resource at, at troubling times like these. And the other thing is more kind of related to my area of interest. I've, I've been watching with excitement as more and more data is gathering in the area of the infant gut microbiome and how, you know, how breastfeeding shapes that and, you know, the role of breastfeeding in child health and maternal health because we've seen kind of really an explosion of research in this area. So getting some more answers and, you know, the research is being done more carefully now, you know, these great cohort studies where they are just putting in much more effective controls and things like that. So I'm, I'm really enjoying doing that. Mm, I love that. I love both of those. And um, I think it's very satisfying as a practitioner when you do start to see um, research, like solid research on things that clinically you've seen evidence of for a long time and you know to be true, but sometimes the, yes, I mean, it's no secret that nutritional research and um, that side of things is not always done, like not always easy to do. So it's very mm -hmm. exciting to hear that there's more progress in that area. Um, very, very good. Um, so let's jump into our topic today, which is all about introducing solids to um, babies, which is, I find so fascinating. And I would love to hear, first of all, when exactly do you think we should begin introducing solid food to babies? such an important question and i think surprisingly a question where there's a lot of confusion mm. <laughs> even amongst health professionals so um it's yeah really great to just start there um i think you know a simple answer is we we want to introduce solids to an individual baby when that individual baby is developmentally ready i'm so sorry i'm no, you're uh, right partner's office and unbeknownst to me has a telephone in here it's a very a very old school ringtone i like it <laughs> I, know. I didn't even know there's a phone in here um do you want to just keep rolling keep rolling i can like edit that out that's all good maybe it's entertainment anyway <laughs> yeah, maybe, um, maybe. <laughs> hope there's no more surprises oh, well, um that's all right so yeah what so there are different views and well not so much different views but there's been different messages that have come through um and what's really heartening to me is more recently we've really had much more consistent messaging from the peak health bodies the bodies that are kind of out there to give advice that on you know timing and who have really looked at the data and um really praise that and, and they're all coming through now with a consistent message of, you know, introducing solids at around six months with that term around um, really in there to show that there will be a little bit of variation, you know, kind of give or take a couple to a few weeks. But we're really seeing that around six months is the right time for, for most um, babies. And um, that's also in line with, you know, the value of having an adequate period of exclusive breastfeeding um, and you know of course not all babies are are being exclusively breastfed but that's kind of the goal is that we're we're managing to get as many as we can exclusively breastfed to that around six months point mm -hmm. um, and I guess when you okay what about the individual baby how do we know when this individual baby is ready and um, we can look for key signs with each with our babies um, important things to look for is good head and torso control so that's being able to basically sit upright with minimal support without slumping and the reason that's important is babies be able, need to be able to do that so they can protect their airway as they're learning that new skill of eating mm -hmm. at the round that the time that they're ready for solids they'll also lose what's called the tongue thrust reflex which is a a clever reflex they have as younger babies to kind of push things out of their mouth so that things that shouldn't be in their mouth don't stay in their mouth it sort of protects them but around six months they'll start to lose that reflex and so some a little earlier some a little later some it might 
actually get lost more closer to seven months. So these are the things that we can we can look for. And then, of course, there's showing an interest in food, which I think is a little bit more of a confusing sign because babies watch everything avidly mm -hmm. and they're interested in everything we do. So um, that, you know, that our baby is avidly watching us eat doesn't necessarily mean that they're ready to eat. Um, they will start doing things like mimicking us chewing and that's still kind of like an, a kind of a pre-sign, I would say, like they're just kind of getting ready, they're, you know, they're, they're practising before they start. Um, what they may do is actually physically grab something, bring it to their mouth and, and munch in a way that they're actually trying to get nutrition from it as opposed mm -hmm. to... We know that babies, they, they do explore the world with their mouth. So they'll put anything in their mouth, you know, from four months onwards, but they won't try and derive nutrition from it. They'll more just kind of explore it. You'll see a different kind of like different way of working mm. <laughs> at, at that food when they're, they're more ready. And I guess when we're thinking about this readiness, we're also thinking, you know, what do I want? What sort of development needs to happen in my baby so that they are ready? You know, what are what are we needing to have kind of up and running? And and the thing about younger babies is, is that their guts are very immature, their liver's immature, and their kidneys are immature. So we really don't want solids coming in before these systems are ready for, for them. Um, and when we talk about guts, their guts being immature, you know, they, have, they produce less stomach acid than um, older, like toddlers or um, children or adults. They produce less um, protein breaking down enzymes, so their capacity to actually break down proteins is a lot less. And their guts are leaky, so they can absorb whole proteins more easily. They don't have the same immune defence in their guts. And I think the kidney development's a really important one because their kidneys are quite vulnerable to the wrong kind of exposure. Like they, they a younger baby their kidneys can be really kind of put under strain when they're given too high protein or um, uh, we call it a too high solute load. So um, that's when there's like the mineral portion and the protein portion, and the salt portion is out of balance within the food. And that's, that's why breast milk is kind of perfect for these younger babies because that's all kind of perfectly arranged for their little system. So we, yeah, these things, as much as we're excited about our babies having solids, we really want them to be actually physically and developmentally ready to have them. And we don't want them to kind of miss out on that important exclusive breastfeeding chapter that, that's pretty fundamental for their development. I want to kind of shortchange them and shorten that if we can. Mm. That's so interesting. And from that, I have about a billion questions <laughs> because it's so, so many little um so many little things in there that I feel people would have questions on. So the first is when you mentioned the signs baby shows that they are ready to have solids, is it something where all three of those signs that you mentioned there in relation to interest in food, um, the tongue thrust and also um, the ability to hold their head up, do all three need to be met before you're thinking, okay, this is kind of the time to introduce foods or is it a matter of most of them being met? How do, how do we advise parents around that? The general recommendation would be all three of those are met and that you might see that earlier kind of interest with us is that kind of watching avidly um, before the other ones become you know fully developed yeah. Mm, yeah that makes sense and um in relation to and we might actually go into this a little bit further but um just in relation to how you've mentioned there that you know kidneys liver gut etc are not um, adequately developed um, really early on and that is one of the reasons we wait in particular um, a lot around protein does that mean or does that imply at all that when you're starting to introduce foods to your baby that you're starting with lower protein ones or is it assumed that by the time they are showing all those signs of readiness that they are at a point where um, they can have foods that are higher in protein. Yeah, by the time that they're showing all those signs of readiness, they they can cope 
with those higher protein foods, but they tend to only just have a little sample of them. So it's kind of a small so small exposure really early on. So they're, they're still the bulk of what's going in is breast milk, but the point is that they they can cope with that protein. They can, like if there's some sort of like infective, like a pathogen or something on there, they, they're more like to neutralise and break that down um, if, yeah, if yeah. there's um, allergens there, they're more likely to break down some of those proteins more effectively. Mm, that makes sense. And in terms of, you know, introducing foods too early, um, what are some of the risks of introducing them too early um, to make everyone aware of? So I obviously heard you say, you know, just not the readiness for their um, mm. organs and the risk of infection if they can't produce enough stomach acid to neutralise those pathogens. Is there anything else that comes to mind in relation to risks? Absolutely. And if I guess kind of pre-frame that by going back to that concept of, um, you know, how valuable having an adequate time being exclusively breastfed is for development in terms of we talked about protection from infection that's not just um you know the like the you know protection from risk of like eating something that had a, a bug on it but actually just the breast milk has you know through that immune kind of that hybrid immune system we would call it between the mother and the baby the mother's immune system is really protecting the baby so um having that protection allows the baby to develop it's not getting um you know having to spend its whole six first six months fighting infections it's it's protected from infection so the baby can just focus on really developing and if they do get infections they'll tend to be milder um, and then there's the developmental programming that we understand is happening at this time kind of this fundamental programming which is driven in part by the infant microbiome but also the many other components in breast milk which really are just sending message, messages to that baby's body around how to develop and this will be affecting their metabolic health, their tendency to be resistant to diabetes or to be less likely to be overweight, be helping to develop their immune health and also potentially um, even their cognitive health. So when we look at the data around, you know, risk um, and if we look at, you know, populations in sort of more affluent countries, which might, we might relate to more, we see early introduction of solids. So before the six months, the, the areas where there's the strongest data um, are increased susceptibility to infection. So we see when babies, even in, in richer countries, uh, receiving solids earlier, they're more likely to get respiratory tract infections. They're more likely to get gastrointestinal infections. And when they get those infections, they're more likely to be severe. They're more likely to require hospitalizations, for example. So breast milk is still protecting them, but it's like that protection is a bit diluted by bringing the solids in early. The other area where there's reasonably strong evidence is around um, risk of becoming overweight and or obesity. Um, those are the kind of areas where the kind of the data is strongest and it, you know, it makes sense that we're probably going to see increased risk of metabolic disease. Um, and as we're learning more about this area, you know, it's, there's studies suggesting, you know, that that longer um, period of exclusive breastfeeding is really protective for the baby's brain development. Um, so, you know, potentially there's um, some protection um, from developing autistic spectrum disorders, for example, particularly in populations at risk. Um, the other concern if solids are brought in too early is um, displacing uh, breast milk from the diet. And breast milk, of course, is really a nutritionally complete food for the, for the baby. So if we bring something else in too early, we, we can affect the baby meeting their nutritional needs. And then as I guess just broadly that concept of just potentially causing irritation to their gut because their gut's not ready. Mm, isn't that fascinating? I just find the whole how amazing our bodies are just so interesting in terms of, you know, our immune systems and, and our guts and how complex they are, yet how looked after they are by 
nature and how things are intended to be. It will never stop fascinating. It's fascinating me there. I guess another question I have that has just come to mind is what about delaying introduction, introducing foods too late? If, mm-hmm. if someone is delaying them by, you know, two, three, four months, does that come with its detriments as well? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's such a balance. And and it's also an evolving area of understanding. You know, we're always learning more. So, you know, if you had me up to speak about this in another year, I might say something slightly different. Mm. But um, there, you know, babies are born with basically most of their iron and zinc stores, um, and they get very small amounts of iron and zinc from breast milk. So, um, they that's enough to kind of keep topping up their status. But if we were to go on without bringing in foods um, for a a long time past six months and it will vary very much on the baby, Um, there is a risk that they'll um, deplete those stores um, and and end up with a deficiency. So as as solids are coming in, um, most nutrients are completely covered by breast milk, but iron and zinc are exceptions. So that's, that's one, I guess, risk that could come up if we were to just delay and delay and delay solids. Um, mm. The other thing that researchers talk about and, you know, we're, we're still trying to understand better is this concept of the tolerance window around bringing in potential allergens, this idea that there might be, uh, you know, ideal time, you know, to bring those in, you know, not too early, not too late. And, you know, if we kept on delaying bringing them in, then maybe we would miss out on our babies developing tolerance to to those potential allergens. Um, mm-hmm. Having said that, I think part of what supports um, babies to develop tolerance is bringing in food allergens when breast milk is the predominant food. Like that's, um, I think, you know, this is still, you know, theoretical, but it, this, mm-hmm. it seems to me that that's part of the makeup of um, helping with developing tolerances that we really got breast milk still as a, one of the main foods as these um, food allergens come in. But I, it's, it does seem, you know, the data is really suggesting getting these allergens in before um, 12 months seems to be important. Yeah, and that's so interesting because I have to say that that's one of the questions I get asked the most um, by, I mean, I don't treat um, children in particular, but I certainly do I have plenty of pregnant clients and plenty, plenty of friends with, uh, with babies at the moment. And that's one of the questions I get asked the most is in relation to allergens and introducing. And there's many stories of people, you know, giving their um, babies peanuts outside the emergency room just in case. So mm. I guess where I'd like to start with unpacking that a little bit further is when you're saying allergens, what are some of the most common ones that you're referring to in that collective statement? You kind of got, let's see if I can remember them all on the spot, but the big peanuts eight. Is you know, the, is peanuts. the one I think of first. Yeah, definitely peanuts. And then the other tree nuts. Um, so cashews, walnuts pecans, you know, almonds, those ones are probably the ones that come up more commonly than Mm. Brazil nuts and macadamia nuts, for example. Um, Sesame is a reasonably common allergen. Uh, Cow's milk protein, egg, I think those are the ones that we most commonly see as allergens in this age group, but we can also have, you know, um, shellfish and um, soy and that's reasonably common actually in this age group as well. Mm. Um, it's important to note that goat's milk is reasonably common allergen too and there's quite a bit of cross-reactivity between cow's milk and goat's milk sensitivity. So, you know, in the past I think there was this tendency to want to replace cow's milk with goat's milk but we do have to be cautious about that. Um, mm. Yeah, so they, they'd be the, the, the kind of the common ones that we we be careful of as they're coming in. Yeah. And how do you recommend that parents go about introducing those particular allergens to their babies? So outside of um, optimally or ideally trying to introduce them when we're in that window of um, 
kind of between six to 12 yeah. or 12 months and we are still breastfeeding predominantly. Is there a method to how you recommend doing it? Um, and do you recommend sitting in the emergency car park <laughs> or is there a, another option? I think if you've got a strong family history of allergy, so that you've got another child with severe um, food allergy or you or your um, the father's other parent has, um, you know, that kind of history, then it's really important to have some medical support um, and to be working with a, an experienced practitioner. Um, and, yes, yeah, so I, I would definitely recommend that to start with. Um, there's really interesting data on the value of mothers. Um, this is particularly on peanuts and eggs. The research shows that when mothers eat, eat them during their pregnancy and um, during breastfeeding, this really helps reduce the risk of allergies um, in, to these foods. Obviously, that's not possible if you've got a peanut allergy yourself, but if, if, you, if that's possible, then I think that, that's a, a really great thing to do. Um, in, uh, Mana, we talked about when breast milk is still predominant, the predominant food is a good time to bring them in. I think also just, you know, have the baby have a nice tummy full of breast milk before you offer the food making sure the baby is well at the time. So avoid starting a new potential allergenic food when your baby's sick, you know, if they've had a gut infection, even a respiratory infection, if they've got a fever or had a fever in the last couple of days, or if they've just had a vaccine, for example, you kind of don't want any of those things that might just stir up the immune system or make the gut more leaky present right then when you're doing that. Um, and I really like the idea of offering foods in there their kind of most tolerable form first. So, for example, peanuts, there's some suggestion that if you're able to obtain raw peanuts and boil them for a number of hours, um, they'll, that'll be a more tolerable form than the classic peanut butter option, which is roasted. And the roasting seems to enhance the allergenicity of the peanut, whereas boiling will have more of a softening effect. So, and maybe a gentler way of bringing it in. And there was some earlier kind of research coming out of Israel where they were suggesting that they had quite low peanut allergy there, but they do use peanuts as a, an early food, but they give them in this um, more boiled form that kind of, I think, sparked people's interest in that. Which I, I, yeah, so that's a method I use. Um, and it's also a method I use when I'm working very cautiously and closely with other medical practitioners to see if we can... Um, look at kind of bringing bringing peanuts in gently in a in a in a child that's sensitive. That's obviously extremely um, you know there's some important safety things to be taken care of, and you really need to be working with um, support to do that. But I, I think it's sort of encouraging that there's this possibility of bringing things in a gentle form and apply that same principle to other foods when you know, we've, when we're kind of a little more worried about allergies with a particular baby. So eggs, less allergenic when they're baked, for example, and the yolk is less allergenic than the whites. And we can sort of start kind of with that latter concept. Mm. The other thing I think to be um, conscious of is it's about bringing that food in and then you need that regular exposure. So ideally continuing to have it we clear at least fortnightly so the baby, you know, just maintains that tolerance. Um, mm. And one other thing that I'd mention is that, you know, we're becoming more and more aware of the possibility of allergies developing through contact on the skin. So that's just something to be aware of in particularly a baby with eczema. We want to be really careful that they, if we can avoid, you know, them having um, exposure to potential allergens on their skin because they may and that may put them at risk of um, developing an allergy to that to that food. Just like, you know, can imagine the situation where you've got an older sibling that's eating peanut butter around a baby. It's like sometimes yeah. hard to control. Yeah, absolutely. And also just the amount of ingredients that are in skincare things. Oh, now that's right. Yeah. Checking, checking that and uh, deciphering what seems like a complete different language sometimes as well on the back of them can probably be a good step in the right direction. Um, that's really fascinating about the peanuts and, and boiling them. And I guess they they won't know what they're missing out on in terms of roasted peanut butter. So they probably won't, oh, know, right. Right? They won't know any different. <laughs> 
Because when you first exactly. said that, I thought, oh, gross. But then I was like, how oh, boring. Yeah, they're not going to, it's not like they've had crunchy peanut butter before. So their, their, their uh, baseline is very um, limited and clear there. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, you're just really needing to be more careful in those, in those baby with higher, higher risks. But if there isn't really a family history of, I mean, most people have some allergy in their family these days, but if it's, you know, if it's fairly mild, you know, you don't have to be putting as much energy into this. Yeah. And we are, just just to be clear for everyone listening, we are talking about allergic reactions as opposed to intolerances, aren't we? When yeah, we're checking for family history. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that's hay fever, asthma or eczema would be the key elements to um, be aware of in your family like what the yeah. what the family history of those things are and yeah certainly mm-hmm. if anyone has anaphylaxis to um a food then that that puts you in the high risk category yeah and a couple of other questions just on that is there any advantage to putting and this might sound like a silly question but putting the food that you're going to introduce that might potentially be a problem like putting a little bit of it on their skin to see if there's any skin reaction before putting it in their body or is it not something that is recommended it's such that's a really good question i'm glad you asked that um i i like the more i learn about this possibility of setting up allergy through the skin I feel more and more cautious about things like that. Same with, say, skin prick allergy testing in babies. You know, it's like the same sort of thing. It's like, oh, like sometimes there's a value for it because you're just trying to get information so you can get clarity. But mm. just with this, there just seems to be more data really suggesting that that might be how these allergies get set up. It's like the body is meeting that protein in the wrong way. It doesn't want mm. to meet it through the skin wants to meet it through the gut yeah that's interesting um because yeah that's where i got the idea from is the skin prick tests which are often done as Mm. you know i mean in adults anyway that i'm aware of and sat by the sounds of it in in some children too Mm. but i hear what you're saying because it's a completely different way of what would naturally kind of be presented um in terms of um, coming into contact with an with an allergen, so that's really fascinating. What about uh, a couple of other questions that I know I'm going to get if I don't ask <laughs> them? <is> sure. <laughs> what about gluten and wheat? Because we have um, a lot of uh, people that listen to the podcast who eat gluten free diets, either from a celiac perspective or from feeling better without it. And I know that that's going to be a question that comes up in terms of is wheat or gluten a common allergen and if so how do we go about you know approaching that side of things with our children yeah that absolutely is i don't think i listed that on our list of eight so you can have two different types of reactions you can probably have lots of reactions to wheat actually but the i guess in terms of these immunological reactions you might have a wheat allergy in the same way that you that that babies would react to peanuts in that they could have, they call an IgE reaction, so quite a fast reaction that's fairly obvious, um, or they could have celiac disease, as you said. Um, and in terms of promoting tolerance and preventing um, preventing celiac direct disease, it's, it's like kind of difficult dilemma for parents. I think when you, especially if you've got a, you know, a family member who has confirmed celiac disease. Um, And I think it's kind of an evolving story with the data. But um, my read on this is obviously if you actually have celiac disease and you're not, there's no way you want to be exposed to gluten. But if you're, if we're talking about a baby who potentially has we're unaware whether they have celiac disease. They're otherwise thriving and we want to prevent them from developing celiac disease. I think um, with that concept of this um, tolerance window, I think it is important that they do have some exposure to gluten so they have the potential to develop tolerance rather than just completely avoiding it. Uh, I think, you know, you don't want to do that immediately on commencement of solids but I think you know before the age of one you know probably around nine ten months is you know potentially a good time um and key things are uh 
the things I said before about making sure they're not sick, making sure they've got a good load of breast milk and um, just keeping that dose low and using something like a, you know, like a traditional um, sourdough, either rye or spelt sourdough and, and really just a small, you know, a sprinkle of crumbs on something they're eating initially. And, and again, that concept of giving that weekly or fortnightly for a period of time. Mm. Um, I, that that's the, what I recommend in my practice, but I, I'm I'm really watching this space to see what else comes out. Um, some of the the early kind of cautions around development of celiac disease really showed stronger risk when babies had um, gluten when they had an infection, and if they weren't being breastfed, and when they had a really high dose. So those are the things that I'm sort of thinking about. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Um, Because I think it's becoming more and more um, a choice that people are making for themselves as adults in terms of even if they don't have celiac disease to not have any gluten. And to be completely transparent, I recommend that for a lot of my um, thyroid patients who have Hashimoto's and in some other situations from what I've seen work best. However, I think when it comes to children, what's interesting, and I, I think the question that as at least has come to me in the past is in relation to, well, even if I am going to make the choice not to make gluten a heavy component of my child's life in the years that I can control what they're eating, is there an advantage to still reintroducing it in that window before 12, 12 months old, which sounds like it is because you're at least... Um, presenting it to the immune system would that be correct if someone was going to make the decision of i'm not going to have gluten be in their diet for Mm -hmm. most of their life but would they still be at an advantage to at least introducing it early um so that when inevitably they probably will have sporadic exposures there is more resilience there i think so yeah and probably extending that exposure you know into that second year of life too, just kind of maybe you know just making sure they're still getting some exposure low level small amounts in those more traditional forms but yeah i mean i think that's one of the really big problems it can be a very dominant part of the diet very easily so um mm, yeah yeah keeping, keeping yeah. it as a, a low background um exposure particularly in that scenario where when there are known to be family members that are sensitive to it um yeah i think that's yeah no that makes makes a lot of sense and so in just kind of shifting gears a little bit in terms of when we are actually introducing solids to children are there any common problems that parents run run into when introducing food? So a common one that pops pops to mind is constipation. Is is mm. um, is that true in terms of that can happen? And if so, are there any other things that can happen as well? I would say constipation is the most common presentation I see in my clinic yep. around this time, and I would actually say it's more common than not. Mm. I just it's just so incredibly you know common why it for this to come up. Um, I think you know, breast milk's got some lovely stool softening actions naturally in it. Mm. And so when the, with that transition to solids, that's a pretty big adjustment for the bowel. Uh, and then I think it's about the, the balance of the types of foods that come in. So we, you know, the, some of the common foods that um, babies might be given, like rice cereal or um, banana even, um, mm. and meat, which, you know, has got really important nutritional value, um, are constipating. So, you know, um, it's just really important that we're bringing in things that are more bowel movers to balance um, those constipating foods and, and also trying to help that be a slow transition that we don't see this kind of less sudden overnight that our babies are now having three meals. It's going to somehow deal with that. Down to some sour to <laughs> smashed avo on sourdough. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I hear yeah. you. So if they do, ex- so, well, first of all, when you mentioned they're like balancing it out with some non constipating foods, what would be some examples of, um, you know, to balance out the meat and banana and rice cereal that's coming in? What, what would be some other examples of things they could include? Yeah. So I guess we're going to put things in categories. 
of whether they were bowel movers neutral or constipating. I just see vegetables as actually neutral. Like you would sort of imagine them as being movers, but I think they really tend to be a bit more neutral. They don't really push things along. Beetroot would be an exception. That's a bit of a bowel mover. And then really we do need to use the fruits. And um, sometimes people worry because they're like, oh, my baby's just going to get used to things that are sweet. But to remember that breast milk is yeah quite sweet so your baby's already used to sweet things and we just you know i recommend avoiding you know things that are unnaturally sweet like grapes and um dates and dried fruit for example but you know raspberries and blackberries and um, kiwi fruits as long as they're not sensitive to them all those fruits with the edible seeds really um help to keep things soft um and think about fruits the goal of fruit is to get through your digestive system quick enough so that the seed is still viable to grow <laughs> the end. So that's yeah. why fruit fruit fibers tend to move things along a bit more than a vegetable fiber for example so and those are really lovely you know antioxidant rich foods for babies to have as well mm-hmm. yeah I'm making me hungry just to be that <laughs> <laughs> um and what about if if doing the food side of things is not enough in terms of balancing out um you know, neutral constipating or movers, non-movers, if you are still experiencing constipation, is there like supplements, is there other things that Mm. we can do from a natural medicine perspective and obviously under the guidance of a practitioner, but what are some examples that you might use clinically in that instance? Sure, and I I, I probably should highlight why that's important to do that because I think, you know, Usually I find we can resolve this with adjustments with the food or just just backing the solids off a bit, you know, like going, making sure we're feeding, uh, breastfeeding our babies before offering solids and, and really just trying to kind of back it off a little bit. But when, you know, when this, when constipation occurs in babies, um, they, you know, they can get quite large hard stools and they can end up even getting like anal fissures, little splits um, in, in their rectum, an anus which is you know painful for them so Mm. then they can start to hold on and so then the constipation can get worse because they're frightened of pooing and you can just sort of see how that can be you know the beginning of a a, an issue that stays with them through childhood and you know in clinic I do see people where we track back where constipation started for them and it's since infancy and you can and now that I see you know in, in practice how commonly this occurs for babies you can sort of just see so that's why it is really important to really nip it in the bud. And if we can't um, resolve it quickly with um, some dietary shifts, then, um, yes, definitely working with a practitioner. I find lactulose uh, a really safe um, treatment to use. Um, it's a prebiotic, so it's, um, it's, you know, it's got auxiliary benefits and it, it's very effective at softening things. And, and we really just want to keep everything soft and moving well until it, it's nice and stable and that, that baby's no longer fearful of, um, yeah, of, of passing a bowel movement. Mm, yeah, I can imagine that would definitely be an issue with, with children. And, um, gosh, I've even, see, I've even seen, oh, I do see constipation develop in adults from them, well, intentionally in this case, holding in their stool because they're too busy. Mm. And yep. it's just, yeah, amazing what what power that can have and what influence it can have as well. So lactulose sounds like a, a winner there. Um, what about, so I guess this is kind of backtracking a little bit, but it just came to mind because I'm thinking back to when I was in university and we were going through this ourselves. And I don't know if you can correct me if this has changed, but I recall something about there was this, encouragement of introducing like being really intentional about making sure you introduce dairy at a certain age and then at a certain age switching it to light milk dairy now dawn for context i got trained as a dietitian so yeah uh, i do not agree with what was stated in that thing but what's your yeah. opinion on the whole dairy side of things and is it again like the wheat where we want to introduce it even if we're not going to be intentional with it like what's the story around that yeah i was i was also i was like i, was, I did it 
naturopathy training, but our nutrition was taught by dietitians. So I got the same <laughs> so message. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Yes. Um, so, and this comes up for me all the time in clinic because um, parents feel that, you know, their one-year-old should be having cups of milk. You know, they're like, okay, by now I should be giving them cups of milk. Mm. Um, and I think... I think the, a key message is that breast milk is a wonderful source of calcium. So if you're continuing to breastfeed, you know, into that second year, um, we don't need to be worrying about calcium. And cow's milk has, you know, a bunch of concerns uh, around it, you know, particularly if it's going to be like a, you know, occupying quite a bit of a space in the diet, then there are some detrimental effects. And like it's... Um, going to compete is going to affect iron absorption which you know we as we talked about before this is a critical nutrients for for these little ones to get on top of so we really don't want to have you know a big player in their diet affecting their iron absorption um it's quite irritating particularly under the um age of 12 months and i think that's part of why the no no um, whole milk before 12 months message was about is because it does seem to cause micro bleeding in the gut under under 12 months. And then it's, con you know, a lot of the cow's milk um, products are constipating. So we've talked about how that's, that's an issue for these babies. Um, and some of the more kind of recent research coming out around, you know, what happens for health when um, cow's milk represents a large um, portion of the solid food intake what we're seeing is you know later development of obesity and they're suggesting that is um, correlated with alterations in the infant microbiome by just having too much you know, cow's milk product in their diet which this is not actually looking at formula it was actually looking at um, cow's milk based products as solid foods or you know whole milk um, and I like I was kind of a little bit astounded by the amount of data that was showing that because mm. <laughs> i mean it's it, 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 i guess it does make sense but um i think you know i ideally we want to see breast milk as that nutritional backbone and then we want to see a lovely varied diet and i think you know as we're talking about wheat i i, I really do want babies to develop um tolerance for dairy and that's the reason in my mind to bring it in to help them you know not be allergic to it so we again we're wanting to bring it in in small small portions and in a nice um, well tolerated form and in this case um seems that um aged hard cheese um the the casing changes that happen um the protein in dairy is a bit more tolerated in that form so that's kind of a nice way of offering it early and you're just going to be considering just offering shape not like a big hunk of cheese just some mm. shavings into something um also cooking it can increase the tolerability and um or a traditional yogurt and again we just don't want it to be occupying a large um part of their diet you know yogurt obviously it's kind of a convenient food to feed babies but it's um yeah it's yeah we don't really want that to occupy a big space because of all those reasons obviously with the you know with it's a different story when we're working with a baby who's, you know, not not receiving that breast milk. We, we do have to come up with different um, ways of making sure they are getting their calcium needs met. Mm, and I think sometimes people forget or maybe have just not been educated that there are other foods that contain calcium besides dairy, which I think even working with adults, it's a constant re-education that I have to give around, you know, like, yes, dairy is a source of calcium, but yes. so is fish with bones in it, uh, bone yeah. broth, sesame seeds, leafy greens, that like there's a lot of um, re-education that has to happen. I think we've been like there's very much that thinking of oh we you know a glass of milk a few glasses of milk a day is healthy and you've got to have mm. you know, I mean I even think back to my childhood when um, I was growing up that was very much the message that I got and I had a glass of milk most days of my life when I was little yeah the right thing to do absolutely and I think you know back in the sort of times when there were you know probably I'm not sure when this was perhaps in the second world war but there was food shortages and they were bring, bringing in milk to schools to um to make sure that they were 
getting enough food. So I think it's in our culture <laughs> we, yeah. that yep. we need cups of milk. Yeah, totally. I mean, I love the taste, but I feel terrible on it. So. <laughs> Yeah. Have a well, why not have a species specific milk <laughs> i know right <laughs> crazy so yeah. what about your opinion on uh, so we've kind of talked about what we're reintroducing mm. and time mm. frames and that side of things another really popular uh question that i get asked that i'd love to hear your opinion on or even your experience in is baby led weaning is it something that you're a fan of you're not a fan of what's your thoughts around that sure um i i mean i i love the concept of baby led weaning and i did use that with two of my daughters and and it, you know, it was very successful for us more so with one than the other i think that um and it's probably worth just introducing for um, i'm sure many listeners know what it is but this is the concept where um you're rather than feeding your baby um, purees off a spoon, you're giving your baby um, things that they can hold in their hand and, and so that your baby can be in control of how much they're putting in their mouth, how much they take. And so I guess the idea is that the parents will decide what's on offer and then the baby will decide how much they're going to have. Um, and, you know, there's some there's some beautiful elements of that. You know, it's this kind of... You're seeing introducing solids as this kind of exploratory journey, and the child has potential to learn self-regulation around, you know, eating and their appetite. And um, there's potentially more scope for sharing family meals together, or you know, having you know the baby just eat something from the family meal that's suitable. And I guess implicit in this is this trust that the the infant's motor skills will match their nutritional needs. And I think, um, you know, you can see those lovely elements of it and, you know, some of the studies that, you know, that's there's not that much research that's been done, but there is a bit coming out. And there is this suggestion that um, this method of fooding um, decreases fussiness around food in children and, and helps them to be more accepting of texture and um, have eat a greater variety of fruit and vegetables, for example, and potentially may be associated with decreased obesity. Um, but, you know, there are, I think it's, it is that situation where it really isn't for every baby and the two kind of big drawbacks, I guess, that might come up for parents are, concerns around choking and also which I can talk a bit more about and also you know the situation where the infant's motor skills and stamina may not match their nutritional needs so they may not be able to extract enough iron and zinc or additional energy out of those um, foods that they're being um, offered and and I guess the third thing that um, comes up is but this really applies to when we offer purees as well as are, are, we, are we making sure we're offering appropriate foods? Obviously, we don't want babies to be starting out solids eating like a, a um, deep fried um, chip, you know, mm. potato chip where, well, you know, that might be something that's on the family plate and I don't really want that to be um, what kids are starting out on. But that's, you know, something that can very much be... Um, managed and you know parents can can really make sure they're offering really healthy options but around i guess the choking question um the you know the passionate um proponents of baby led weaning will um really talk about this phenomena where the babies will have a heightened gag reflex at around six months so that the the trigger point for that gag reflex actually moves forward down their tongue and that this is a way of them protecting their airway so that when anything comes near there, they'll, they'll gag um, and they'll talk about how we need to um, know the difference between choking and gagging. And I think, you know, that that's um, really valuable and um, some parents will be comfortable with that and then others will just find that experience really stressful. Um, mm anyone embarking on baby led weaning it's really advisable to do baby first aid training and i think that's just a good thing to do anyway having a baby yeah. <laughs> but 
it, but definitely having some comfort in being able to sit with your baby and see them kind of working with a piece of food and potentially gagging a bit. Like you need to have to be able to have some comfort with that. Um, that was something that you know we we managed fine in in our family setting. But I've worked with many families that have just felt like, oh, actually, I'm not comfortable with that. I mean, we, there's ways of managing it around just starting by offering foods that are much um, less likely to easier for babies to manage and less likely to uh, you know present a challenge like that. And then also, you know, it's just incredibly important that we're really aware of avoiding all the higher risk choking foods like things like leaves or um, vegetables and fruits with a skin on them that can come apart and and because those sort of things can slide around in the baby's mouth and 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 block their airway also wanting to avoid you know, hard round foods or things that can break off in chunks things like an apple actually is a pretty mm. common choking hazard uh, yeah, yeah so that worked on one of those as an adult. So as an adult, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So what um, would be some examples of good um baby wed leaning foods to start with if someone is like they're wanting to try it but they are nervous about that side of things. Yeah. And I think like if you're choosing a like and I guess the other point and point to make is you can you can absolutely do a mix and it's really valuable for your children for your babies to have an opportunity to explore um, different textures and, and exper- you know, have that develop those skills that they develop when they hand feed themselves and you know, something that's generally really safe. And like whenever we're feeding our babies, we need to watch them like a hawk, but um, it's just, you're not going to get much nutrition out of it, but fun to play with. There's a stick of celery, all those longitudinal fibres really hold everything together well Mm. um also um parsnips um because again they've got all those nice longitudinal fibers that mean that the baby can mouth um a steamed parsnip and and get little bits off but the whole um section mostly just stays intact and i suppose those are the things to look for or um another um yeah pretty like (laughs) comfortable safe option is an organic um rock melon rind where you just uh scoop most of the flesh off so they've just kind of got the rind with a little bit of flesh on there that they can work at things like that can be easier um gentle introductions to that world and it can be really fun because you're just kind of you know you're really watching them explore but, um, yeah yeah. Oh, I like that. I'm getting excited for when I can watch it the, my, the next baby eat. It sounds, sounds like a an interesting show. But I agree with you. It's, you know, it sounds like there, there can be a halfway point if you're feeling a bit reluctant. And I would definitely encourage people to get support in that when you're, when you're doing it. Because I think as, especially I can imagine as a pe- being a parent for the first time, going yeah. through that process it's probably even more scary because rarely have we even seen an adult choke by like by the time we're having um children it's very it's easy to just maybe describe it but seeing it actually happen in front of you i can imagine is a a different story so perhaps uh yeah having a bit of education and support around that and taking it slow sounds like a an approach that might feel a little bit better for a lot of parents Absolutely. And that just reminded me of another key point there. Well, two actually. One is, you know, parents do become very in tune with their baby's motor skills. So they kind of can gradually step things along. And um, yeah, so that, I guess that certainly happens. We start off slow and we, we just, we learn what they can handle and it's changing day by day, week by week. Um, and the other thing is, in, I think inherent in any feeding style we just really need to make sure that we're feeding our babies in a very responsive way so that we're really letting them drive how much they have. So if we are um, doing spoon feeding or puree, for example, that we're just um, avoiding the aeroplane scenario. <laughs> we get one more scoop in. <laughs> we really want to just be checking in with them and, and, and stopping when they've had enough. Mm. Don't worry about throwing the rest of the bowl out. Yeah. 
That's such a good point because I even remember when I was feeding my cousins, I was encouraged to do that aeroplane uh, aeroplane game, and I, yeah. I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking that is the right. Like, well, once upon a time, thinking that's the right way to do things. So, thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's common. It's very cultural. Yeah. All right. So my last couple of questions for you is, well, the first one is, are there any other common myths or misconceptions? And there may not be. So if there's not, that's totally fine. But are there any, yeah, any other misconceptions that you wanted to address in relation to this topic? Yeah, we have covered some of them. But um, one that I see quite a bit in practice is um, parents worrying when they can see whole food chunks in their baby's poo and thinking that means that their baby's digest there's a problem with their baby's digestion. I just want to reassure, reassure people that that doesn't mean there's a problem <laughs> with mm-hmm. digestion. Um, that you know the baby hasn't learned to really masticate things yet, to really chew things up well yet naturally. And their digestive function is immature. Plus, even adults don't have enzymes to break down cellulose. So if we, you know, just bite a piece of celery, it'll come out in our poo. Like, we don't, mm. <laughs> we don't have a way of breaking that down. Yeah. Um, but I, I, that's something I see a bit, that parents getting worried about seeing those, you know, chunks of food in their baby's poo. Um, another one is, um, I think we probably covered this, but I think it's just that thing of... Um, you know, that lens change that happens where we stop seeing breast milk as a food, it's struck quite extraordinary. We've, like, grown our whole baby with our milk and our bodies and then we start introducing solids and then we start just kind of watching their food they're eating and thinking that's what's making them grow <laughs> and forget that actually this milk, breast milk is still, like, an important core food for them. I yeah. feel like I've probably drawn that point. <laughs> no, we, I love your breast milk pa- passion. It's, I, I absolutely love it. And just to be clear, because I feel like I probably didn't ask you this um, in a clear enough way before, but for everyone listening, when you say having um, breast milk before food, you literally mean we're in the day when you're like giving your baby solids, making sure that before they fill up on solid food that breast milk is like the main dish and um, – the solid food is dessert. Is that what you mean by um, by that? Absolutely. And I think that's also like really valuable for making the solid feeding more fun for the baby too because you can just imagine being ravenous and trying to learn a new skill. Oh, God. <laughs> but in terms of try making make me sure. do that now. It's terrible. <laughs> I know. When you're hangry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. And a, a really important breastfeed to preserve as that first morning feed I sometimes see parents dropping that out because they're worried that their baby's not eating enough kind of porridge or other breakfast they're offering them and like that actually that morning breastfeed is like morning that is their breakfast you know? mm. <laughs> that's more nutritious for them so yeah Much and the same formula too. If, if, we've, if we're working you know if a baby's a formula fed baby um, we have to be careful not to drop that out too quickly as well mm. You've just made me think of another question. <laughs> I could sure. ask you questions forever, but I, I really would like to know the answer to this one. Do you have any, when it comes to formula feeding, do you have any preference for the type of formula? So there's obviously a lot of different types out there, but the two that come to mind are the cow's milk-based ones and the goat's milk-based ones. Is there anything that you have to um, say around those two options or if there's any other options? Yeah, I, I I often completely shy away from this question. <laughs> you can shy away from it if you want to. There, there is no obligation. I, mean, I think I would. the things I would say is lactose is really important for babies. So mm. there are some like, you know, there's some really tricky marketing that happens with formulas. They're all trying to get an edge on each other and that's something we have to be aware of as consumers. They're all trying to sell what their formula could offer your baby and just know that you know it's very rare for a baby to have um a lactose intolerance because lactose is uh, like the main energy source normally for babies and they are usually very good at handling lactose unless um they have some sort of temporary 
um, inflammation in the bowel, but lactose, you know, is important for their for their brain development. And um, yeah, so be cautious around um, offering a lactose free formula. There would be, you know, occasional times when that was appropriate, but um, that's something I definitely see um, over used um, and the you know the extensively the allergy formulas um, the data on those uh, suggest they are not valued for preventing allergy so that's the other important myth to bust mm. um, so if you if your baby's formula fed and they do have an actual kind of allergy to cow's milk protein then that um, could yeah, could be an important option, but in mm. for prevention, um, they they may yeah may potentially be have no effect or potentially be detrimental in terms of developing um, other allergies. So that those mm. would be the two comments I would make. And um, I I guess the other important um, place to go when when people are asking about a um, a formula option is just to make sure that first of all we've covered off um, seeing if there's any other breastfeeding support we can offer and then we're also if we're looking at a younger baby um, exploring the option of um, donor human milk which is going to be um, preferable to uh, a formula option if we can find a you know a, um, a safe and secure option mm. I love that. I think you answered that beautifully, Dawn. <laughs> no shying away there. I think I think it's a really hard question to answer because I can imagine that not only is every baby different, but every mother is different, every situation is different. There are sometimes situations where the assumption is I can't breastfeed, um, but there might be other avenues to explore or, um, yeah, lots of things to consider in the context of that. So beautifully answered. Um, so the final question, which will be a much easier one, is <laughs> if people do want to work with you or find out more about you or hear more of your information, where should they go? So I have a few courses available at Probiotic Advisor. You can go to the Probiotic Advisor website and see that's actually an introduction to solids course there and um, a few other um, courses that relate to infant maternal health. Um, and then clinically, I work at Gould's Natural Medicine in Hobart and we do um, in-person as well as um, Skype-based appointments as well there. Amazing. Well, I'll make sure that all those links are in the show notes. And thank you so much for sharing your incredible knowledge with us today. I know that I'm not the only one that would have gotten a lot out of that.